Welcome back to the second hour of Sports Call here on a Friday afternoon, a a cool, crisp Friday afternoon. Fall definitely in the air. A little touch of winter early, Andy, uh, as a prep football game night here in the state of Alabama. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, region titles on the line tonight. And, uh, again, hopefully here in just a little bit, we will have Tom Luganbill with us. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we communicated with him a little bit earlier, and uh, I know he's a busy man, Andy, uh, as he is the uh, the, the head of uh, recruiting for, for ESPN, also a sideline analyst now uh, for, for ESPN. So uh, it's always fun to have Tom on uh, the show. Let's uh, currently talk about uh, – uh, where Auburn sits right now as far as recruiting is concerned, according to the ESPN rankings. Uh, they have Auburn at 15th right now behind a Clemson team, uh, Notre Dame, LSU, Ohio State, uh, Texas A&M, Florida, Texas, Michigan, Georgia, Miami, Tennessee, and Florida State at two and Alabama number one. So uh, a lot of great teams right there in front uh, of our Auburn Tigers. But, uh, uh, again, uh, some of those schools have 27 to 25 uh, commitments. Auburn only has 16. So outside of uh, Florida with 14 uh, and Michigan with 15, we have uh, the f- the fewest out of that top 15 there, Andy. Yeah, and I think that bodes well for Auburn. Uh, uh, it looks like Auburn may try to sign 23 to 25 maybe in this class. So uh, a lot of uh, – they can be kind of picky about who they – uh, go after really hard uh, coming down the stretch here. They've already, like you said, got 16 commitments. So, yeah, and you got yeah, and 16 commitments. So it's going to be interesting to see. But uh, now let's go to the phone lines. I think we do have Tom with us. Tom Luganbill, college football analyst and national recruiting director for ESPN. Tom, you with us? I am. How are you doing today, Tom? We're doing great, my man. Brett Pritchard here, along with Andy Graham, and uh, again. Thank you for taking some time out to join us here uh, on the program this afternoon. And, uh, again, we're here in Auburn country. Uh, This is an Auburn-based show, so we're going to mainly focus on the Auburn Tigers and where they sit. And I'll start there. Uh, uh, Auburn currently uh, uh, number 11 in the polls and uh, uh, number uh, number 15 on y'all's recruiting ranking. So uh, Gus Malzahn, his first year, got some things going right. Well, he's done a great job, and I think his familiarity with the current roster that he inherited and, more importantly, knowing where the holes are and how to adjust and work around them. I think that's one of the things that's the most undervalued trait of Gus Malzahn's strength as a coach is he can maximize strength and mask weaknesses, and he's, he's exceptionally good at doing that. And, you know, I saw this team in person twice last year. And there were some positions within this team that were so bad from a productivity standpoint that there was really no chance for them to overcome it. And he has come in, and I think he's, he's remanufactured chemistry, confidence, and then he's actually employing schematic things on the offensive and defensive side of the football that really fit what this roster is capable of doing. And I think that's why you've seen such a dramatic turnaround. Uh, Tom, this is Andy. Uh, you know, we all know how we feel down here uh, in the South and especially in the Auburn area. Uh, Auburn made an enormous jump from 24 all the way to 11 uh, going on the road and being Texas A&M. Uh, I'm curious to uh, what your impression from a national perspective is. Is Are the Auburn Tigers back? Are they for real? Uh, do you feel like uh, moving forward? Well, I think a lot of the answer to that question is relative to – what else is going on across the landscape of college football right now? We're seeing more and more parity than ever before, particularly in the SEC. You know, teams like Texas Tech at number 10, and then a Baylor and a Miami, a Missouri, all in the top 10 of the first initial BCS standings, kind of paints that picture. Do I think that they have made significant strides in the right direction and are building a foundation and nucleus for long-term success? Absolutely. But I think there are several teams, Auburn included, and some of the other teams I referenced that are, are, are good teams, but maybe not as good as where they are ranked. I certainly don't think Miami is. I think it's just one of those years where you're comparing teams against other teams and how they've performed, and you've got to spot guys in certain positions. Here's what I like uh, about Auburn right now is they've made it through a couple of tough games that people perceive to be losses in the preseason. Now you look at the back end of the schedule and the prognosis and the confidence and the expectation level 
is a, an entirely different one for Auburn than anybody would have probably imagined at this stage. And uh, if they can avoid the injury bug, if they continue to produce and not get caught up reading their press clippings, I think it's a team that could find themselves with one loss heading into the Iron Bowl. There's a lot of football to be played there, but if you look at the remaining schedule, they are going to be a team on the on the ascent while they're going to be facing some teams on the decline. Yeah, well, uh, while I've got you here and you're being a recruiting expert, I've got a question that I'm I'm curious about. Uh, you know, recruiting has you know blown up, especially in the last ten years. It's just become kind of a an entity all to itself. And we see kids, you know, and, and uh, changing their minds at the last minute and these things and, you know, really uh, that being a topic of conversation. Uh, do you see uh, in the near future an early signing period when recruiting, as far as recruiting is concerned? I, I think that we could see that, but so many things I think will unfold before we see that. For, for example, one thing that the coaches I know would prefer to have happen is, is a reworking of all the various recruiting periods. You know, now we have a quiet period and a dead period and a, an evaluation period and a contact period. I think that needs to be simplified. I think it needs to be tapered down and made, I, I think, more transparent and easier to follow for the coaches across the country. The issue that you're going to have and some blowback you're going to have uh, in regards to an early signing period, is you're going to really create an uneven playing field based on the stature of the programs. Because let's just say, for example, you are a program that has great resources. You have a longstanding tradition. You've had a history of winning. You're a, you're a, a notable program on a national scale. If you have an early signing period, programs in that in that mold are going to have significant advantages on getting head starts on the next class. So we're in 14 now. They they'd have a huge advantage on 15 and then 16, while other programs wouldn't necessarily be playing by those sets of rules. And I think that's very concerning to some coaches that we try as best we can to be on a competitive level playing field where everybody's playing with the same deck of cards. And I think there's a scare there in relationship to an early signing period that that could dramatically alter it. And so, hey, listen, we're in a fast-paced, accelerated recruiting period now where guys are getting evaluated as freshmen and sophomores. I don't agree with it, but it's the world that we're living in. So that's not going to change. So you're going to continue to have decommitment. You're going to continue to have guys changing their minds, guys committing too early. And that's a vicious cycle that coaches are going to have to continue to contend with. And, you know, Tom, it's, it's been happening for a long time, but now with all the social media and stuff, it's almost like up to the second. We know when kids decide if they're wavering a little bit, we're trying to get reads on these kids based on their social media accounts, and sometimes they play people and all. So it, it is kind of a game. But, uh, you know, it's kind of gone on uh, for a long time, but now we just know about it because of the technology. Tom, I want to go in another direction, talk about this Auburn recruiting class specifically right now. Currently ranked 15th, but if you look at the commitments, only 16. A lot of the teams ahead of them have at least 18. Uh, several of them, like Texas, have 24, Miami 27, Tennessee with 27, Florida State 25, and Alabama with 21. So uh, Andy and I were talking about it earlier. It bodes well for Auburn with only 16 commitments to, to take a, a good jump up the rankings. Well, recruiting is a marathon. It's not a sprint, and there's going to be an awful lot that's going to take place over the next couple of months. and and in leading into signing day. And, and keep in mind, you know, when, when you have a coaching change, and this year now, this recruiting calendar year for Auburn and the staff, is Gus Malzahn's first where they haven't had to be in hurry-up mode or catch-up mode or trying to close things out before signing day with a class that you didn't recruit. And that's generally when you see the biggest push. You see, I think, the biggest jump in production on the recruiting trail. And I think that's what we're seeing now with Auburn. You know, everything isn't about the best player. Obviously, you've got to have great players, but you've got to have the right player. And in my opinion, and, and knowing this Auburn program and, and, and obviously having a relationship with Gus Malzahn, other members of the staff, the one thing that they have got to do is they have got to avoid making errors on people, not players, on people, because – I think that's what really plagued their 2010, 2011 classes where you had some really good players in those classes, but maybe not the right kind of guy. And as a result, a lot of those players are no longer in the program. 
That depletes your talent, and it depletes your depth. So the decisions that Gus Malzahn and their staff are making are not only decisions about talent and getting the right player, but decisions on getting the right person, because that in and of itself, from a, ke- from a chemistry and an intangible standpoint, is critical to the overall success of a long-term program. Now, I couldn't agree more, Tom. Uh, again, character issues have been a problem in the past, and I think that is uh, correct. I mean, it's not all about four and five stars most of the time. It's uh, who you bring in, the caliber of person that you bring in that you want to be part of your program. One other thing that I want to ask you before we let you go uh, this afternoon, Tom, uh, the playoff versus the BCS. This is the last year of the BCS. Uh, looks like uh, it could be controversial uh, going out while wouldn't it be? Of course, it's the last one. Uh, uh, the BCS uh, wants to, to rear its head here and uh, create some controversy. Uh, but playoff versus the BCS, you know, the new committee uh, now is formed. Uh, you know, nothing is without controversy ever. And, you know, we've got four teams now, and somebody next year will be that fifth team maybe looking on the outside looking in. Uh, what's your take on the whole process? Uh, uh, do you think college football got it right getting away from the BCS and going to the playoff, or do you think they should have just stuck with this system? Well, I think they got it right going to the playoff and the way it's going to be formatted and the way it's going to be seated. I would argue, though, and I would urge fans to take the time and go and look at this, I would argue that there was no need to create a committee. There was no need to add more subjectivity to the process, and here's why. Folks who didn't like the BCS, they didn't like it because they didn't understand it, and it was something that was confusing. But the reality of the situation, guys, is you look at the last 10 years of the BCS process, and if you were to take the final BCS standings heading into the bowl season, and you were to take the top five teams and draw a line under under number four, go look at it. And the top four teams that were selected by the BCS process were the right teams. They were the best teams. No, you go back to two years ago when everybody was talking about Stanford and Oklahoma State. Well, you know what? Under this new playoff format next year, they would have been in the top four. So I think by adding more subjectivity to it, we create a few more dangers. And I know people didn't like the BCS process, but the reality is the BCS process actually would have selected the four best teams over the last decade or so, and that's been proven out. You can go back and look at it, and I think that's something that – should be noted in all of this because with more subjectivity, I, I think you go into a real dangerous area right there. But I do like the expansion of how they're going about playing for the championship and seeding it up so we at least get an opportunity for, for teams to prove it on the field. You know, Tom, I never looked at it that way, but it's a good point. Let the BCS pick the top four teams. Uh, don't bring a, a human committee in there, uh, whereas, uh, again, if you have to recuse yourself, if it's your team or, or that you're affiliated with, so now that that committee is, is minus maybe two or three people that could be on that committee, so now it's down to eight or nine people making the decision. And, uh, uh, again, BCS, could have you could have merged the two. I wonder why they didn't do it that way. Well, there's no question. And keep in mind, you know, everybody thinks that the BCS is all about computers. It's really not. It, you know, it's two thirds of a human element. And so, you know, and listen, you're never, no matter what process you go by selection, you're never going to avoid the, well, it's four teams, what about the 15? Well, if it was eight teams, what about the ninth team? There's always going to be that argument. You can't ever get away from it. But my argument to all those folks that just despise the BCS process, if you actually look at the facts of it, the process by which they came up with the teams put the four best teams in there. And so that's something I'm a little bit skeptical as to why they chose to really take a stand on that and go in a different direction. Yeah, I agree with you. It looks like they may have missed that one a little bit there as they could have used the BCS the way it was set up to create the playoff system, and uh, it may have taken care of itself. But, uh, Tom, uh, more discussion will be coming on this and uh, more controversy, as always, in college football. It's kind of like its own soap opera. That's no doubt about that. But, Tom, hey, man, we appreciate you being part of our program uh, this afternoon. It's always a pleasure to have you on our show. Uh, anytime, thank you for having me. Tom, thank you so much. That's Tom Luganbill there, college football analyst and national recruiting director for ESPN. The Auburn Tigers currently ranked 15th in the ESPN recruiting rankings. And, again, only with 16 commitments. Uh, we'll be going up uh, the ladder, hopefully, uh, with some more 
uh, guys looking to sign 23 to 25 this year. We're up against the break. When we come back, <clears throat> excuse me, when we come back, we'll take your calls, 888-9-TIGER-9 or 887-3401 locally. More of the Friday edition of Sports Call coming your way right after this.